Good evening and welcome to the News Hour Agenda. I'm Madhav Das Gopalakrishnan. The news of an attempt at assassination on former U.S. President Donald Trump's life in fact sent shockwaves across the world. Fortunately, Trump survived the assassination attempt, narrowingly escaping the bullet which grazed Trump's right ear. The sniper attack on Trump has not just quaked politics in the United States but is reverberating here in India as well. In fact, we have seen how there have been chilling parallels drawn between this attack and the threatening language and alleged hate spewed against Prime Minister Modi by his political opponents. And we've also seen leaders citing the Prime Minister's security breach in Punjab when it was under Congress rule. The BJP has said the attack on Donald Trump isn't just about one man, it's about a sinister global agenda that targets popular nationalist leaders. को जो है वो जस्टिफाई करने की कोशिश करेंगे या कर रहे होंगे वो मुझे लगता है ठीक नहीं एक चीज दूसरी चीज ये कि बात सही है कि नरेंद्र मोदी जी के के खिलाफ जिस तरह से भड़काऊ बयानबाजी हुई वो भी बहुत बैड टेस्ट में रही चाहे अमेरिका हो चाहे भारत हो एक इस्लामो लेफ्ट लिबरल कबाल इसी प्रकार की घृणात्मक भावना पैदा करता है और पूरे देश में ऐसा वातावरण बना देता है जिससे कि जो राष्ट्रवादी नेता है उन पर हमले को अंजाम दिया जाए जहां कहीं भी सुव्यवस्था देख रहे हैं सुशासन देख रहे हैं वहां ऐसी परिस्थितियां पैदा करना चाहते हैं कि तंत्र टूट जाए अर्बन नक्सलवाद से आप पार्टी और राहुल गांधी के रूप में अराजक राजनीति के प्रतिनिधित्व बने In the United States, uh, some like Sebastian Gorka, the former advisor to Trump, are specifically citing Biden's recent statement where he said that it's time to put Trump in a bullseye. They're calling it an instigation. Unfortunately, violence is part of the American political scene and has been for more than 200 years. Now, in addition, there's a lot of highly inflammatory political language. Uh, it was President Biden himself, who less than a week ago said we have to put a bullseye on Donald Trump. Now, of course, he meant that metaphorically. He was not calling on somebody to assassinate Donald Trump, potentially inspire uh, those who, well, are obviously, uh, you know, a little too passionate and um, a lot um, have a poor grasp of reality uh, to take actions like this. They demonized my former boss for the last eight years. They called him literally a Nazi, a fascist, a white supremacist. Sadly, it was inevitable that somebody would act on those words. Mm. So the fact that Joe Biden five days ago at an event said that we need to put a bullseye on President Trump tells you everything you need to know. There's one political party that has normalized violence in America, and it's not us. It's not the Republicans. Back home, we've seen BJP leaders listing a series of alleged similar, quote-unquote, threatening comments made by Congress leaders in the past to claim that a hateful rhetoric is a direct cause of popular leaders being targeted. Here are old comments the BJP has dug out and highlighted. नरेंद्र मोदी तेरा कोई हाल होगा भी अब क्या बोलेंगे किसी ऐसे की मौत होती है ऐसे नरेंद्र मोदी की मौत होगी मोदी हिटलर की राह चलेगा तो हिटलर की मौत मरेगा ये याद रख लो मोदी ये जो नरेंद्र मोदी अभी भाषण दे रहा है मैं आपको बता रहा हूँ छह महीने बाद सात आठ महीने बाद ये घर से नहीं निकल पाएगा हिंदुस्तान के युवा हिंदुस्तान के युवा इसको ऐसा डंडा मारेंगे इसको समझा देंगे कि हिंदुस्तान के युवा को रोजगार देने के बिना ये देश आगे नहीं बढ़ सकता Now the BJP's attack has drawn sharp response from the Congress party. Pawan Khera has accused the BJP of playing cheap politics over the issue of security of leaders. And he's countered the BJP by saying that Prime Minister Modi has been instigating people against Congress leadership. He's also cited security downgrade of top Congress leaders by the BJP government. Rahul Gandhi ke dadi ne is desh ke liye atangwaad se lardte huye us samay apne pranon ki ahud desh ko bachane ke liye. Rahul Gandhi ke pita ne इस देश की एकता और अखंडता की रक्षा के लिए अपने प्राणों को निछावर किया है भाजपा एक डरपोक पार्टी है बुजदिल पार्टी है उसमें आतंकवाद से लड़ने का साहस नहीं है जिस गांधी परिवार ने अपने दो दो सपूत 
श्री राजीव गांधी जी श्रीमती इंदिरा गांधी जी आतंकवाद में भेंट चढ़ाई हूं जिस पार्टी की पूरी की पूरी इकाई छत्तीसगढ़ में नक्सली आतंक के हमले में मारी गई हो उस पार्टी को आप ज्ञान देना बंद कीजिए और And joining us for these shocking incidents coming out of the United States, we have with us Lisa Curtis, who has been a former deputy assistant to President Trump and is also the director of the Indo-Pacific Security Program at the Center for New American Security, and former, of course, deputy assistant, as I mentioned earlier. Thank you so much for speaking to Times Now, Lisa Curtis. Let me begin by asking you, what was your first reaction to what happened yesterday when you heard the news for the first time? Well, it was one of utter shock uh, that something like this can happen in U.S. politics is just really jarring. I think for the average American. Um, but my, you know, of course, I was relieved that President Trump, former President Trump, was okay. That he had, uh, you know, been injured, but was was okay enough to stand up to pump his fist. To tell his supporters to keep fighting, uh, this was uh, quite remarkable. I think this is an image that uh, will stick with us for the rest of history. Um, this is something that shows uh, former President Trump's uh, strength, his fortitude, his commitment uh, to to leading uh, the American people. So I think this is something that. Uh, will not leave the minds of Americans anytime soon. This was just a remarkable moment, not only in this particular election campaign, but really in American political history. Absolutely, but did you ever imagine that something like this could potentially happen? And I'm asking you this because the Secret Service is run by a group of thorough professionals. How could they have got it so wrong? So. It's not so shocking that something like this happened because this is a very um, divided political election campaign. The rhetoric has been very sharp. Uh, we also know there have been several incidents of violence, uh, particularly you know by young people at, at schools. So I don't think it's so surprising that something like this happened. Mm. But when you look at the location of the shooter, that is uh, striking. It is striking that the U.S. Secret Service did not have this location locked down. So I think there are questions for the U.S. Secret Service to answer, and they have some explaining to do. The fact that a shooter could get uh, within, you know, 500 feet or so of a former president uh, at an election rally um, is unacceptable. And I think this is something that, that needs uh, deeper investigation. Of course, President Biden has already opened an independent investigation into how this happened. So we should know the facts pretty soon. But yes, that to me, the most shocking part is that the shooter could ever get that kind of access uh, at this kind of event. Absolutely. And after this incident, uh, President Trump has stated in an interview that the most incredible thing was that uh, I happened to not only turn but to turn at the exact right time and just the right amount. If I'd only half turned, it would have hit the back of my brain. The chances of me making a perfect turn are probably one-tenth of one percent, so I'm not supposed to be here. And clearly this bullet was aimed at his head. So do you believe that this was the act of a lone disgruntled 20-year-old? Or could there be a larger plot behind it? Look, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered about this shooter. And, of course, you know, there will be conspiracy theories. We still hear about conspiracy theories following the assassination of uh, John F. Kennedy. So, you know, we there will be conspiracies out there until we know more. I think we will know more. Uh, we already know this was uh, a young man. Uh, they've interviewed fellow students at his high school where he just graduated a couple of years ago. Uh, we know he was quiet. We know that he may have been bullied. Uh, we also know that we have a mental health crisis here in the United States among our young men in particular. So I think that, you know, we will 
um, understand much more in the coming days. And we just have to be careful to not make any assumptions or, you know, try to uh, fill in the blanks with our uneducated guess- guesses. I know this is um, the human condition. We, we want answers. We want them quickly. But we're going to have to be patient and we're going to have to wait. All right. And also, there are certain questions that are being raised about the secret servers, the security protocols. We've seen a bystander particularly stating, and I know you've covered this uh, aspect in your earlier answer, but they've specifically spoken about a shooter climbing onto a building. And one of these videos on social media says that people were witness to the shooter climbing on the roof. Now, secret service has blamed the local police, saying that they were tasked with securing properties that surrounded the Trump Valley rally venue. And is it the case that the Secret Service doesn't play any role in securing the perimeter? Could this simply be a case of negligence, for instance? What's your view on that? Well, I'm not an expert on the Secret Service, so I'm, I'm not going to comment on that specifically. But I do know that, you know, at the end of the day, it is the U.S. Secret Service that is responsible for securing uh, former presidents of the United States, as well as, of course, serving presidents. So I think that they they will not be able to shift the blame uh, for this. Um, ultimately, it is uh, incumbent on the U.S. Secret Service to make sure that the former president is completely protected. Of course, they're going to work in tandem with the local authorities, but they the buck stops at the U.S. Secret Service, so that they have to explain um, if there were any lapses in in that uh, security protection that day. Right. And this particular shooter has used his father's registered gun, an AR-556 uh, rifle is what we are told. And the Center for Disease Control Prevention data, the CDC data, as reported by Pew Research Center, has also painted a dire picture of 48,830 gun-related deaths in 2021. Now, this is a very, very harsh reality, and there are, of course, uh, uh, demands that there should be immediate attention and action to address America's gun violence epidemic. What would you say on this? Well, clearly there's a gun violence problem in the United States, and uh, clearly there's one of uh, younger people getting a hold of guns. Uh, in carrying out terrible acts. We've seen this happen, carrying out terrible acts. We've seen this happen at far too many uh, schools in the United States. Uh, this was also a young person uh, just recently, you know, uh, having graduated from high school. And it, apparently he somehow got a hold of his father's gun. Uh, so, you know, these are questions we have to look at. And again, we don't have much information now. Um, but I think, you know, all of these things will be investigated and it should prompt uh, any leader, any U.S. leader uh, to think about, you know, how a 20 year old uh, gets access to such a powerful gun and is able to carry out something uh, like what we saw on Saturday night. I think, you know, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. Right. And uh, President Joe Biden and his campaign has focused on this narrative that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. Do you think that this incident will force him to change his campaign as a presidential election is just a few months away in November? Well, I think President Biden does have some challenges. Look, he had challenges before this event on Saturday. He was trying to prove to his own party that he was capable of another four years in office. So on the one hand, this um, event has superseded that discussion for now, at least temporarily, and the media is focused on the assassination attempt uh, against former President Trump. Um, but I think eventually, you know, this, this question um, about Biden and his poor debate performance a couple of weeks ago uh, will come back up. And the second challenge, I think, for President Biden is that uh, you know, he he has done the right thing. He's calling for unity. And he has said, that, you know, there's no place for violence in the political system. Um, but he still wants to uh, make a case that the stakes are very high in this uh, election. But he has to be careful to not cross that line because he doesn't want to imply 
that the stakes are so high that somebody could read that as, you know, it's time to, um, you know, take matters into your own hands or use violence uh, to determine the outcome. So I think, you know, he's he's got some real challenges ahead of him. Um, but for now, you know, it certainly has taken some of the heat off him that he faced right after his poor debate performance a couple of weeks ago. Um, but, you know, it, it, there are definitely challenges uh, for him in how he handles his election campaign moving forward. And for now, I think both campaigns have said they want to stress unity. They want to bring the political rhetoric down. So my hope is that, you know, there there would be uh, some silver lining to this terrible tragedy in that it would bring the overall temperature of this political campaign down. Very interesting. Very interesting that uh, the message of, uh, you know, calming down is what's being sent out. But uh, I just want to probe you a little further on that because there are those who are asking whether it's really fair to actually pin the blame on some of the comments made by Democrats uh, during the course of the campaign. And I'm asking you this because, you know, there's a view that statements themselves don't cause incidents. It's the actions of people of the likes of Thomas Crooks because all parties at the end of the day run these vilification campaigns across the world. Across the world, don't they? Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I think that um, the, you know, the responsibility lies on the person that took the act. And so, you know, I think both sides, when, uh, you know, Democrats or Republicans have, you know, made the case that um, it's the the language that led to the violence. But I think that's a very difficult case to make. And, you know, I think that you, you've got to look at um, the person has to take responsibility for their their own actions, in this case, the, the shooter. Um, and but you can learn from the act in that how you conduct yourself moving forward is you're going to you know, take the high ground. You're going to talk about the real issues. Uh, you are going to try to elevate the debate. And as I said, hopefully that is what uh, both leaders take away. So far, it looks like that is the direction they're moving in. They will also have to get this message down to you know their surrogates, their advisors. Um, but we can only hope that they're looking forward and looking at how they can conduct themselves in the future rather than pointing fingers or blaming for things that have happened in the past. Right. And many have compared this attack and said that it's reminiscent of the attack on Ronald Reagan in 81. In light of this attack on Trump, uh, would you think that there should be an increased security presence at campaign events for all candidates, perhaps? And how do you see this act of violence influencing public trust in the democratic process as well? Well, absolutely, there has to be an increase in the security of the candidates. As I said, you know, it's it's unacceptable that this person had access to this building, was able to get so close, and that by the grace of God, uh, you know, former President Trump is okay and he's safe. Uh, so absolutely, they need to, to look at and improve the way they're securing these events for both candidates. Um, so I think that that is, goes without saying. Right. And also, although we've discussed this in a different light, but uh, what's the major political implications that you see coming out of this particular uh, event for the U.S. elections, given that the Democratic Party's divisions and Trump's loyal Republican base are there? Do you think that it could significantly influence the voter sentiment and impact the election outcome? Because, you know, you have billionaires of the likes of Elon Musk who are coming out endorsing Trump openly. What are the political implications of this, in your view, in terms of what could happen in the U.S. polls? So I think it's early to say how this might impact. And one thing that we've been hearing over and over with this election campaign is that people have already made up their mind um, on who they're going to vote for. Maybe, maybe not everybody, but um, large parts of the electorate have already decided. Um, however, I think that, you know, both looking back a couple weeks ago, what happened during the debate and how that impacted 
uh, calls for Biden to step aside. That was a major event. Uh, this, of course, the assassination attempt against former President Trump, um, a hugely significant event. But I would point to how uh, former President Trump reacted in those seconds after uh, somebody attempted to, to take his life. And that was, he stood up, he pumped his fist, he told his supporters to fight, fight. Um, this says something about who he is. It says something about his strength, his fortitude. And even if you're not a supporter of his or you don't support his policies, you simply can't deny that. We never know how people are gonna act in a crisis situation. Well, we, we saw firsthand how former President Trump reacted in the face of danger, uh, in the faces of a major um, uh, tragic event. And he uh, he reacted very quickly and strongly in that moment. And I think, you know, this this is quite remarkable. And this is something that um, will play in, in voters' minds uh, to some degree. But again, it's early in the campaign. We have four months left. Uh, one thing we know about this campaign is it's taken a lot of twists and a lot of twists and turns. Uh, so there may be further twists and turns uh, moving forward. Well, Lisa Curtis, as a former advisor of uh, President Trump, uh, we join you in wishing President Trump a speedy recovery. And I'd like to thank you so much for breaking all of this down and analyzing this for our viewers. Thanks so much indeed. And joining us now, we have Wayne Allen Root, who's a noted TV host and author, joining us live. Uh, Wayne Allen Root, I'd like to first uh, begin by talking about uh, the social media posts that you've put out on the X platform. We're talking about how on stage on Saturday morning in Las Vegas, you were explaining how various uh, interests that are opposed to President Trump, uh, you know, will do anything to stop him. And you've also posted that hours later, I was proven right. So this assassination attempt, did it really take you by surprise in that sense? No, I, I think that Democrats, the deep state, the D.C. swamp, there's a lot of evil people running the United States government right now, and they all have one goal in mind, stopping President Donald J. Trump, and they'll do anything to stop him. I don't know if this assassination attempt was a conspiracy. I don't know if they were involved in it. It may have been a lone shooter. And yet everything points to the fact that what he, what he accomplished trying to kill President Trump, thank God, only trying to kill him, was almost impossible without help from others. He was in a perfect line of sight. It's impossible that the Secret Service allowed him to get in that position. It's impossible that he was able to get the shots off. It, it's a very strange situation, and a lot of heads are gonna roll. It's either complete incompetence or someone on the inside was helping, but my belief is Donald Trump is gonna win this election by a landslide if they allow the election to happen. I've said this before the assassination attempt. I said this before Elon Musk this weekend endorsed President Trump. I said that before this morning's major development that the classified case has been thrown out of court and dismissed. The heavens have opened up for President Trump. I believe he's on his way to a massive landslide, but so you're saying that it's is, completely will, changed will the public sentiment and voter sentiment in this election? Would you say that this has been a landmark event in that sense? Absolutely a landmark event. His reaction, as your last guest said, by the way, his reaction to almost being killed was the most supernatural reaction I've ever seen in my life. Any world leader that comes close to dying and the shot nicks him in the, in the side of his ear, which is a quarter of an inch and he'd be dead. And he's on the ground and he's bleeding and Secret Service are on top of him. And they want to run him off the, off the stage and hide his face. And he refuses to hide his face. He jumps in the air. He pushes his head above the Secret Service agents who are trying to protect his head from possibly another shot and another assailant. And he screams, fight, fight, fight with his fist. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. It's supernatural. And, and I've said this all along. He is touched by God. He is blessed by God. He is chosen by God to be in the right place at the right time to save America and to make America great again. 
Absolutely. And you know, one of the questions that many of us haven't been able to wrap our heads around is that how could the Secret Service get it so wrong? You know, we see them whenever they travel across the world, you know, making advanced detailed security arrangements, liaison meetings taking place months in advance of any tour, and the huge amount of taxpayer dollars that are spent on securing the president, and yet you have something as basic as the roof of a neighboring building not being secured. Right. You know, there are many people who are completely mind-boggled at this. How do you look at it? Well, I think, it, I think it's DEI, which is that term in the United States, diversity, equity, and, uh, 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 all, all the attempts by liberals, inclusion, diversity, equity, inclusion, all the attempts by liberals to destroy our country, in my opinion, by putting people in jobs because of the color of their skin uh, or their political beliefs, not because they're the best at doing the job. I don't want female service agents or black secret service agents. I want anyone, white, black, orange, green, man or woman, who's the best at the job. And yet right now we have administration and the head of, uh, of the secret service, who DEI uh, a believer, DEI, as she said, literally, the number one goal is to get 30% of all the agents to be female. Well, is that best for the president? Is that what's going to protect the president? Was her eye on the president of protecting the president? Or was she too worried about getting more female agents to actually protect the president? And I want to mention one other thing. On the same day that President Trump was speaking, the first lady of America, Jill Biden, speaking nearby, many of Trump's agents, agents and assigned them to Biden's speech. And he didn't have enough agents. At new agents that had put them before. All this led to what happened. It's either pure incompetence or an attempt hmm. uh, to try and make things safe for President Trump. And look, thank God, right. God intervened. Right. I think there's some network issues there. But, uh, you know, I also ask, want to ask you from the counter point of view, because there's also a view that's been expressed that uh, whether it's really fair, to pin everything at the doorstep of the Democrats, because at the end of the day, you know, uh, there are political speeches, there are vilification campaigns that happen in different parts of the world, and it's all pretty much uh, fair when it comes to the elections, and that's how it happens everywhere. But it is ultimately the individual, such as Thomas Crooks, who actually would be responsible. It's not the statement per se that causes the incident, but the individual who takes law into his own hands, wouldn't you say? Well, I've always believed that, that uh, it's the individual. There are murders. There are mass murders. It's not the gun. It's the individual. But I notice Democrats in America always blame guns, not the individual. So it's funny in this one case that now they want to blame the individual. Uh, it's just, it serves their purposes. But I will tell you this. Just days ago, there was a government uh, conference. And on the screen... They listed the worst terrorist threats in America. And next to ISIS, they listed pro-life organizations in the United States. In other words, they think that religious Americans, Christian Americans, Catholic Americans, and conservative Americans are domestic terrorists. And that, my friends, is disgusting and disgraceful and leads to incidents just like this. So Democrats are to blame. All right. Wayne Root, I'd like to thank you so much for taking the time out and speaking to us here at Times Now. Thank you. God bless.